I have returned. It is I, the Slayer of Posers, the most electrifying man in corpse entertainment, the grim one to all, the necro sexual. And I am here in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania at the Main Street Jukebox with the low end assassin, Steve DiGiorgio. Steve, how the hell are you? Fine. No, that was your note. No, all good, man. It's, it's Cool little town. Glad to be here. Nice to meet you. It's an excellent falsetto. <laughs> Welcome to hell by way of the Pocono Mountains, the most grim place on earth. We're here in the Main Street Jukebox. This is a passionate place for me. This is my childhood and adulthood and current record store where I go to get my fix of all the best albums. So, Steve, tell me about one of your favorite record store memories. Well, we were checking out Black Sabbath Sabotage earlier, and uh, I remember the day that came out. I was a very young child, and um, I, my mom let me walk to the mall by myself. It was only, you know, a quarter mile away from the house. And I had a $5 bill. And I was going to say, let's go see what we could get with $5 at the record store. Brand new Sabotage album came out. Four ninety eight sticker. Yes! Slapped that fucker on the counter. Put that $5, stood back like a boss. And the cashier looked at me and goes, it's five twenty four, son. You need to learn about tax. Ah, he let me have it, five bucks. Was there one record that you heard that made you say, you know what, that's it, I'm going to pick up my bass and shred so hard? Tell me about that thought process. Well, I've been playing music since I was a little boy. So music and playing music was always kind of going on for me. But when I had that kind of rock and roll dream, Thunderbolt hit me. Probably had to be an Iron Maiden album. Because once I heard that bass digging in, I was just like, this dude knows what's up, man. You know, that probably Maiden and you know Jethro Tull, Rush, Black Sabbath, all the stuff that's got bass that's you know active and melodic. And I think once I heard that kind of stuff, you know Dio albums and Deep Purple, you know that kind of stuff, it, it kind of all filtered in at the same time. So there's not really like one album, but uh, I was having kind of a bad acid trip once when I was young. And uh, a good friend of mine, he's a bunch of years older than me, he, was, he just got out of the Navy and he saw me kind of tripping. He's all, dude, don't give into it. Don't go down there. You got you to gotta break out of that. And I was like, I didn't know what to do. So went in his bedroom and he put on 2112 by Rush and he had a, a, a Kramer bass and he just played it. You know, and I, I was young, I was still in school, you know, and I was watching him and I was like, now that's freaking cool. And of course I was tripping, so the whole sound experience was... It was crazy. So I remember thinking, I got to do that. So I started learning how to play bass lines on the side of my bed to albums like, like my big buddy did, Ken. So that's around the time, around the same time. It all just started hitting, you know. So next time you're tripping your fucking balls off, put on some Rush. <laughs> Dr. DiGiorgio sent you. <laughs> It'll take purple microdots. <laughs> Steve, another classic album, one of my favorites, Testament of the Gathering, almost 25 years old. And of course, you're reunited with the master Dave Lombardo on drums on tour. Did you ever think that this heavy metal dream team would be reunited again? No, I don't think anyone did, you know, because Dave is a very busy guy. He does a lot of stuff. Um, even in 99, when we finished the record, he had barely agreed to do the first tour run after the album came out. It was a three-week U.S. run, and he didn't seem like he really wanted to, you know, play live with the band very much but he said yeah i'll do the first run out of the gate so they round up all five of us on the album and the first three week run was the five guys on the lineup of the album and uh we did that run but then as planned he was off and running and you know we thought that was history and then uh when gene made it official that he was out and we kind of made it public that we were without gene and we were accepting auditions dave called us because we just it was it was one of those things where it seemed too good, you know, like, like, of course, we would have asked him. He has history with the band and we love the guy. He's a great drummer. But we just figured there's no way, you know, he's too busy and he's, he's high demand. But he came calling to us and we we're like, oh, fuck, yeah. We just pushed all the auditions away and he walked right in and did it. So, no, we didn't foresee it happening, but it's it's been awesome. Delivering the goods with Dave Lombardo and Testament. And The Gathering, a classic Testament album among many eras of Testament. So I want to know 
tell me about one of your memories recording that classic album. <laughs> well, we were younger men back then, so, you know, I like to party a little more than we do. Um, there was some crazy nights in that studio. Uh, a lot of smoke, a lot of, you know, other things. Um, but other, other than that, the recording was kind of standard, just play the song and get a good take. But, um, but we got a little more crazy back then. I remember uh, we showed up uh, to get ready. It was late afternoon or something, and Chuck had already been drinking. And, and it's an old industrial part of Oakland, you know, so it's, you know... I'm not going to say lawless, but it looks pretty crazy out there. And Chuck got his shotgun, and there's, there's a freeway overpass that goes up over the building, and there was a street light way up on the overpass, and he was like trying to hit the, hit the street light. And we walk in the studio, you know, and there's like, you know, mirrors and straws and zigzags and beer bottles everywhere. And Basically sounds like the trial by fire music video, but in real life. Yeah, it was a little, a little crazy. I, we we took the recording serious, you know. When we focus on music, we were good, but you know, like I said, we were a lot younger back then and stuff. Serious riffs for a serious party. And what's one of your favorite Testament deep cuts? Yeah, there's a lot of those, man. Um, back, you know, when Gene was in the band, we would always try to re redo the set list and pick all these killer songs, you know, like off Demonic or off Low. There's a lot of good songs, and you know. The OGs, you know, Eric and Chuck and Alex, they'd be like, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do it. We're like, man, we're arguing for songs on your catalog. Let's go. Let's make this heavy, you know. But they like the classics. And um, But, yeah, some of the deeper cuts, like um, like I like Down for Life. It's a, I don't know if it's a deep cut because it's the second track on Gathering, but it, we played it a lot when the album came out. And then once that song fell off the list, it never came back, you know. And that's just got to – it's it's real – testament to me you know it's like it's got the cool drive it's got thrash it's chuck singing on point i don't know it's just i wish we could bring that one back down for life down for life you heard it coming back maybe or maybe it's down for the count <laughs> it's down for the count <laughs> As a musician, you've been doing it for four decades. Did you ever think you'd still be rocking and rolling at this point of the game? You know, when you're a teenager, you figure you better make it in the music industry before you're 30 or you're going to be an old over the hill. And then when you get to it, you're like, okay, this takes a while. And, and I'm getting close to 30. It feels young. And then you're in your 30s and you're like, all right, this is still cool. You know, I'm still me and we're still working up that hill. And then you get in your 40s and you're like, gosh, damn. Been doing this a long time. Now we're in our 50s. In fact, our singer, Chuck, he's 60 this summer. Well, he just turned 60. So we're like, all right, no one told us that this big number, you're going to feel exactly the same as you did when you were like 19, 20. So no, I had no idea we'd be doing this like this. It, time is a lot shorter in the rear view. <laughs> so be careful, man. You get, you get old real quick. But the good, the positive of it is you still feel yourself when you're up here. Have you ever played any of your old bass lines? And you're like, holy damn, what was I doing back then? Yeah, we do the Death to All tribute band and trying to play what we did. I don't want to be so bold to say reinventing the genre, but Death was kind of, you know, inventing new ways of doing things. And to play that ambitious style when we were 25 at 50 plus, yeah, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge to dig back and do that. Um, but we do, we do. We give it our all and, and we make it happen and, it, and it's tough, but uh, makes you proud of what you did. You know, you're like, hey, I can't believe I came up with this. What a little punk I was and do some stuff that's still relevant these days. So it's cool. Tell me about one of your favorite record stores to visit. Yeah, in California, there's a big chain called, well, I don't know, it's not a big chain, but it's a popular place. There's a location in SoCal and then up where I live in NorCal um, called Amoeba, but there's a smaller, version called Rasputin's. I'm pretty sure that's just a Bay Area thing, maybe two or three stores. And man, I tell you, like I told you earlier, I would spend hours in there just going through everything. I loved it. And it's sad to see them places close down because that's that's how we came up. This is where we find our inspiration, you know, just driving home with the new bag of stuff, you know, you're like, oh, this is going to be cool, you know, and, and that stuff stays with you a lifetime, you know. And so you, you got to find your stuff online, digital now. And I don't know. 
it's still music and it's still inspiring, but there's something lacking, you know, that this type of place has. This is, I mean, just look at the walls covered with memories, old posters, show flyers, you know, all the toys and knickknacks that come with all the boom boxes. I mean, everything here is nostalgic and just reminds you like, yeah, this was the source. What do you think the gnarliest heavy metal album cover art is? Autopsy. <laughs> I know that because I was, I was on there, but for late 80s, coming out with an album cover, a guy being torn apart by meat hooks, that was pretty sick. So that was pretty gnarly. But yeah, as far as classic stuff, I mean, um, the band Yes, they always had like an artist that stuck with them album after album, and his art was also telling a story through time as well as the music progressing, and that, that stuff's attractive. And a band I grew up listening to, Jethro Tull, has always put a lot of cool imagery and you know conceptual stuff into their covers and there was an album that came out in 82 called broadsword and the beast and that's kind of at that when i was that age you know junior high level looking at the old viking imagery and the runes and the the you know the broadsword and the fairy and just that whole mystical vibe man it just it took me on a journey just yeah good memories i can see you're still living the viking life baby <laughs> <laughs> well i mean I'm chronically Norwegian descent, so it, it sticks with me no matter what I do. <laughs> so, Steve, you talked about going to your record store, walking home with the excitement, with your bag of tricks. So I have something to you from the Necrosexual's Hand Basket of Doom. I hope you read it with both hands. This is the Necrosexual comic, 30 pages of full-color necromania. Dude. Hopefully you enjoy that with a nice doobie cigarette, and it puts a big smile on your face, baby. Because I believe that reading is fucking fundamental in this house. And I want to say, Steve, thank you for going one-on-one -on -one with the Grim One. What do you want to say to all the legions of heavy metal hell raises out there? Well, fucking thanks for the gift. Looks awesome. I like, I like the beef. The yeah. prime cut. The hairy, hairy skin looks good. I ate the steak afterward. Nothing was wasted. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Love this vibe and uh, fucking looking forward to the show. Thanks for everyone for coming out, as always, for the support. We've got the Bay Area Thrash show on the road, so. The bottom of the Bay, Steve DiGiorgio with the Necro Sexual! Live on location and damnation at the Main Street Jukebox. Hey, freaks, I will see you in hell.